If you'd like to turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and we'll read verses 35 and then 41 through 51. John 6, 35, then 41 through 51. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who has who is from the from God he has seen the father truly truly i say to you whoever believes have has eternal life i am the bread of life your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that no that one may eat of it and not die I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Do we have a song today? Yeah. Do I even have to ask? Do we? <laughs> Yeah. 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we have this place where we can come together to worship you. That we realize very clearly that your word and your grace and your gospel is for all people. And Lord, as we draw close to you today, I pray that your spirit will meet with us and mold us into the people that you need us to be and that you will feed us that living bread. And in your name we pray, amen. Today I want to invite you on an adventure because that is what real Bible study is. When we study anything, when we deepen our knowledge on any subject, we are exploring. And exploration is an adventure. It opens our eyes and our minds to mysteries yet to be known. When we explore those mysteries, we learn something. We learn that there is always more to know. And the adventure continues. If we have ever spent any time with a toddler, you will quickly find that they tend to be information sponges. They seek out knowledge and they process that information so quickly that adults will, will force them to take a nap just to give them themselves a break from all the questions. We have some toddlers in our meeting. And I'm sure the parents have answered thousands of questions over the course of this week. They, have, they, they may have come close to a thousand just this morning. If there was a motto for a toddler in pretty much every cultural context, that motto would be a single word. Why? Have you ever wondered why that question is so important? Why do children constantly ask that question? Why? It deals with their development. They are attempting to find who they are in relation to everything else around them. When we as parents and as grandparents and friends of the family take the time to explore with the children, we are given the privilege to watch their personalities grow. We are born with this curiosity. We are born with this desire to know, to, to, to be known, and to find where we fit in the world around us. Every child asks why, and our answer to that question can have deep and lasting impacts on who they will become. The most interesting thing is as we grow, we still ask those questions. We still seek answers. We are still searching for our place in the world around us. This, this never really stops. But at times, we silence that desire. At times, we tell ourselves to shut up and know our place. We develop this over the course of time as well. We have asked too many questions and annoyed our parents, so we stop asking them because we don't want to get into trouble. Our teachers have become annoyed with the questions, so we stop asking. Or maybe our peers who have been silenced in their own homes as a child are threatened by our continued pursuit of knowledge, so they bully and seek to silence the curiosity within you. We are silenced by those because those around us have stopped. They have had their curiosity quelched. But that desire is still deep in our souls. We still want to know. We still wonder. And we get glimpses of this when an unexpected package comes in the mail. Imagine a yellow, a large yellow envelope with that special bubble cushioning inside. We look at the address and we see the name and we place it on a table and we look at it. 
What is the first thing that comes to mind when you get one of those packages in the mail? What is inside? What did I order? What did my spouse order? We have these questions going through our minds as we look at that package. This is the sense of curiosity in our nature. And what do we want to do? We want to open it. And once you open it, we're probably not as excited as, as because we quickly remember what we ordered. But on occasion, that anticipation is met with even more excitement. On May 4th, I received one of those mysterious yellow envelopes. And it had my name on it. I did not order anything. And I didn't know why the return address on this envelope was from my insurance agent. What could I have possibly received from this guy that would require that type of envelope? I looked at the envelope and I, I wondered what could possibly be inside, so I opened it. Every year my insurance agent sends a cookie to his clients. I didn't know that at the time, so when I opened that package, I was excited when my curiosity was greeted with a, a large and very tasty cookie. That is a tasty example of the rewards of curiosity. And I must admit that the path of curiosity doesn't always end so well. When we explore the mysteries around us, we do gain something, no matter what that is. We gain knowledge and wisdom. God told Solomon that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I've always found that statement curious. And I've decided that, that when we pursue wisdom and knowledge while staying focused on God, it will deepen our faith as well as our understanding of the world that God created. Today, I want us to go on an adventure. I want us to be curious about Scripture. I want us to ask questions and to seek answers. I want us to become like a toddler, trying to understand the world around us. Because that's what we are when it comes to our understanding in relation to the wisdom of God. I have degrees. I have pieces of paper that basically tell me that all I am is a child with a lot of questions. And I spent good money on those pieces of paper. Today we begin with the verse that we ended with last week. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus says these words to a group of people that had recently experienced one of the most remarkable things recorded in Scripture. Jesus had taught a multitude of, of individuals late into the day, and it was recorded that there were 5,000 men in that multitude. They did not even count the number of, of women and children in that group, but it's estimated that there could have been around 10,000 people present. On that day. And Jesus told the disciples to feed them. And we've heard this story many times. The disciples didn't even know where to begin. But they found a young boy. With a basket of five loaves and two fish. And Jesus took those loaves. And he thanked God for the food that. For the food and had the disciples distribute the pieces that he broke off. We are told that everyone that day ate their fill. Meaning that their hungry, hunger was completely satisfied. And at the end the disciples gathered twelve baskets full of leftover food. This crowd of people was amazed. And rightfully so. Jesus had satisfied their hunger. They had eaten their fill. And they didn't even have to labor for it. This raised questions in their mind because it reminded, uh, reminded them of the stories that they had heard since their childhood. 
their ancestors while wandering in the wilderness were given manna from heaven to satisfy their hunger. I love the word manna. It literally means, what is it? How many of us have asked that question when we have come to the table? I, it's a question that I often ask when I ate at my grandma's house because she had the habit of putting zucchini in almost everything. So I'd often ask, what is it? Tell me the truth, Grandma. What is it? <laughs> so is it really cake or is it a vegetable pie? The tribes of Israel wandered through the desert eating what is it? And somehow, wherever it came from, and somehow whatever it was kept them going, even though they didn't know what it was or where it came from. What is it? The people of Israel took whatever it was and they made it into bread. We still don't know exactly what it is, but the properties resembled the properties of grain flour. Whatever it was, they knew how to prepare it because bread had been a staple of human diets from the dawn of civilization. Bread is a word used for the most basic form of solid food in several ancient languages. Even words like meat, fish, and cow in some of those ancient languages are derived from a form or from the word for bread. Bread is that substance that allows for and maintains life. The importance of bread in, in the ancient Middle Eastern culture is deep. Wages were often paid in bread instead of currency. So having, the abundance, having an abundance of bread or not having to worry about what you would eat became a sign of wealth. And if someone had an abundance of bread, they could then trade that bread for goods and services, which means bread became the foundation of economics. This economy of bread became a symbol of life and blessing, and the lack of bread became a symbol of divine displeasure. The connection of life, blessing, and the attention of the deities led to many religious practices to be developed around bread. This is even present in the practices of ancient Israel. Jesus said to the people that followed him across the sea that they sought after him because they ate the bread, not because they had faith. All this cultic devotion to bread and Jesus says that they are there only because they ate, not because they believed. They followed what gave them temporary satisfaction with the hope that they could have, that more would follow. They were not seeking God, but they were seeking to ease their pangs of hunger. And once hunger was no longer part of the equation, they then turned their attention to other things, just like the children of Israel in the wilderness. They grumbled. They grumbled because they had a perceived injustice, because that's what that word grumble means. It's a grumbling against an injustice. Every day God provided the nation with manna from heaven, yet they grumbled. They would not starve, but they perceived that God was not good enough because they only got manna and not meat. This grumbling, grumbling grew and became so intense that they threatened, threatened the life of Moses and began to yearn for the life of bondage that they experienced in Egypt because there they at least had meat on occasion. Their basic needs were given to them, but they grumbled because of the perception of having more somewhere else. 
This disconsent, disconsent content is deeply rooted in our human condition. Our perceptions can be skewed, and we begin to become envious of others. They saw that Egypt had more. So in their mind, the mind of the grumbling Israelites, the Egyptian gods were more powerful. They were being led astray from God by the desires of their heart. It were in their case, the desires of their stomachs. The Hebrew people grumbled when talking to Jesus as well. If he could feed us, he should feed us. Moses did. So the fact that Jesus wasn't giving them more bread at that moment made them upset. And they demanded signs. The people of Israel did continue to follow Moses after God saved his life. But there was a cost to this grumbling. The generation that grumbled, the generation that was distracted with envy, with the envy of others, were not allowed into the land of promise. The only ones that entered that land were the ones that knew only the goodness of God. That generation began looking at the food that they had received as being something more than just bread. The bread that they were given was life. It was a symbolic representation of God's word and wisdom. Manna moved from what it is, meaning what it is, and moved into logos, or the word. Bread to the children of the promise became something that connected them with God, and to eat it became an act of worship. This line of thinking moved into, moved with them into the land, and it remained with bread, even after the manna was no longer falling from the skies. What is bread? It is that substance that sustains life, but it is more. Bread is the conduit of God's wisdom and blessing. It is God that provides the necessities of life. And the Hebrew people acknowledge this by beginning every meal by thanking God for the bread. Even Jesus participated in this practice by giving thanks to God when he broke the bread that that child gave him that would eventually feed the multitudes. This thanksgiving and blessing moved, moved the purpose of bread away from just sustaining life into a conversation. That which sustains life should also enrich life and be shared with others. It is this conduit of God's wisdom that we should focus on today. That is what the people were grumbling about when Jesus said that, that he was the bread come down from heaven. He is telling them that he is the manna. He is the embodiment or the incarnation of God's holy wisdom. He is God. He is calling us to himself. He is offering to us that substance that sustains life and provides more meaning to move forward. He is wisdom. Like Nicodemus and the concept of being born from above or being born again, the people did not understand and they wondered, how can this be? We know Jesus' father and mother. How can he come down from heaven? How can he offer this wisdom? How can he? The mysteries of God are great. We will never know them fully. But that limitation should not stop us from exploring. I have spent hours this week studying something that I thought I knew. I grew up on a farm. I was raised understanding where the food that we eat come from. I participated in the, the first steps of that process. 
I planted the seeds that became the, br the grain, which became the flour that ultimately became the bread that is shared. But even a dirt farmer can learn more about bread. I read about the different cultures and, and, and different processes of making bread. I learned about the economics of bread and why certain breads are more common in certain areas than others. I learned about bread. Then I looked at the offerings of the temple. There was bread offered on the altar and bread that sat on a table that stood before the veil that separated man from God. Bread is involved in worship. Then I continued to look deeper. And I began to read about the various sacrifices and offerings that took place in that temple and came to a sacrifice called the peace offering, which is found in Leviticus 7, verses 11 to 18, if you wanted to look at it. This is a special offering because this type of offering is, is one being The one that's being offering that sacrifice gets to participate in it, unlike a lot of the other sacrifices. Most offerings are either burnt on the altar or consumed by the priests, but the peace offering is shared with God and the worshipers. This offering begins with loaves of bread, one of which is offered to God and the others are given to the worshiper. This offering begins with, the, with loaves of bread that are burned on the altar. And then a perfect animal from the herd is ritualistically slaughtered, and the blood and the fat of this animal is thrown onto the altar with, with the bread. And that remaining, and what remains of the bread and the meat is to be consumed and shared with those that are worshiping. The remaining meat and bread are given back to the worshiper to be eaten in whatever manner that they wish to eat it. This offering of peace is to be shared, eaten, not wasted. And if you couldn't finish that meat in a day, you could continue eating it on the second day. But on the third day, whatever remains of that, that offering was to be burned. Jesus says, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. I am the substance that sustains life, as well as the wisdom that moves life forward. But he is more. He is the flesh offered as a sacrifice. He shares life with us even unto death, and on the third day he raises to life from the grave. He is the peace offering, the conduit through which God and mankind are again joined. That is the offering that should be shared. Not just should be shared, it's an offering that must be shared. It's a joyous communion restoring that relationship that was once lost. And it gives us a glimpse of what will be. God with us, always. Sharing a meal with us, sharing conversation with us, us being friends with God. The problem is we have reduced bread. We no longer regard it in the right context. Bread is just bread. It's merely the vehicle that we use to eat a hamburger without getting our fingers messy. And in our low-carb and gluten-free culture, bread is not even considered a staple of life anymore. But bread is so much more. It is the peace offering that God offers to us. It is God calling us back to him. It is a meal to be shared, to deepen, and to make friendships. Every meal that we eat is an opportunity to celebrate life together and to testify to the power of Christ 
who overcomes death to restore life. Every meal that we should eat, or at that we eat, should be eaten with others, so that through that shared bread of peace, the kingdom of God can be fulfilled on earth as it is in heaven. I want us to go on a journey today. I want us to, dis to discover and rediscover the things that bring meaning to our life. I want us to see that of God in ourselves so that we can encourage that in others. I want us to experience the fullness and the wonders of God's mercy and grace that has been given to us through Christ and which is available to us if we entrust all that we have and believe that he truly is the giver and the preserver of life. As we now enter into this time of open worship in communion in the manner of friends, I want us to think about the bread that we have. I want us to think about what that bread is and how that bread has sustained our life. And I want us to look at that bread and thank God for all that he has done for us and all that he is doing for us. And that that bread is God asking us to join with him in expanding his kingdom throughout the earth. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that your desire is to have communion with us. You do not need us to do anything in this world, but your desire is to share life with us. You desire it so much that you sent your son to live among mankind to teach us what life with you truly looks like and is like. And you provided a way for that life to be a reality through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection on the third day. And we participate in that life through the Holy Spirit who calls us and teaches us and guides us. Lord God, you have given us a peace offering in Christ. <clears throat> And you've called us to sit and eat at your table so that we can join in that fellowship and friendship and participate in that kingdom that you've called us to. And as we go out of here today, let us remember that peace that you have made with every meal that we eat. And may we share that life with everyone that we come across throughout this week. And in your name we pray. Amen. May the love of God, which gives life to the world, sustain you. May the bread of life, Jesus Christ, feed you with the food that endures to eternal life. May the power of the Holy Spirit nourish and strengthen you in faith. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.